After a year of charging my Tesla Model Y on a plain old Wow outlet, I decided to take on the self-installation of the Home Flex from ChargePoint. This version comes with the NACS or North American Charging Standard plug, which will be nice because it will allow me to charge my Tesla without an adapter. Let's start off by mounting the unit. It comes with a mounting template, a drill bit, and other hardware needed to complete the job. You'll want to find a stud behind the wall to mount the unit to as it can be quite heavy when the charging cable is wrapped around it for storage. We'll have to open the unit and drive the bolt through these holes from the front. When you open it for the first time, there's some warnings and steps. This door comes off. And there we go, our first look inside the charger. So those are where the mounting bolts go through. This is a rear knockout. If you have conduit in your wall and want a nice clean installation, not seeing any conduit, that would be your ticket. We're coming up from the bottom. The left side is where your power comes in. The right side, that goes out to the vehicle. Now you'll want to leave a little bit of space between the head of the bolt and the wall so that the charger unit can slide down over the head of the bolt. Here is the cord as it comes in the box for the ChargePoint HomeFlex. This is the part that goes into the EVSE. There are our leads. On the electric vehicle supply cable, the ground is actually the left one. And their diagrams indicate having the red one in the middle and the black one to the right. Get our cable clip here. And then we'll go ahead and the last part is popping in the holster for this particular style of plug. Now we have a holster. Now for the conduit. I used a spider hole saw and drill to drill through the concrete between my basement and the garage, taking advantage of an existing crack in the seam between concrete blocks. As for the conduit, I chose to go with PVC since it's a nice compromise between cost and durability. It does, however, require you to pull a dedicated ground wire, which I'll talk about later. To figure out what size conduit you need, use a conduit fill calculator. I used one on southwire.com. Circuits with two or more wires must have a fill factor below 40%, so use your calculator, make sure you're underneath that number. A uh, three-quarter inch conduit would have worked in this application, but since I'm doubling it with a stove circuit, I chose to use one inch all the way up until the last PVC junction box. I'll then use a three quarter inch flexible liquid tight conduit in order to enter the EVSE housing as that requires three quarter inch conduit. After de-energizing and opening my main service panel, I ran a fish tape through the finished conduit out to the garage so we could pull the wires for the charger. So I want my charger to be able to supply the maximum amount of current that my Tesla Model Y can support. So I'm designing a circuit capable of delivering 48 amps to the EVSE. Now the electric vehicle supply equipment is considered a continuous load, meaning it can operate for three or more hours at a time. Therefore, my wires must be rated at 125% of the desired charging amperage. This gives us 48 times 1.25, resulting in a 60 amp ceiling. Furthermore, I'm also planning on running some wires in the same conduit for an electric stove outlet in my kitchen. So because of this, I need to derate this wire rating by a further 80%. So we take our 60 amps, divide it by 0.8, and we have a 75 amp requirement for my wires now. Looking at table 310.16, six gauge copper wire with a 90 degrees Celsius temperature rating perfectly meets this criteria of 75 amps. This is good because the charge point home flex also does not accept any gauge larger than six gauge. So I got lucky since an 80 amp rating would have required four gauge, which wouldn't have worked with this particular charger. Now for the ground wire. If you use EMT, IMC, or RMC conduit, you technically don't need a ground wire since the metal conduit can serve as the ground path back to your service panel. 
However, it's still recommended to run dedicated ground just in case your conduit doesn't mate perfectly with each piece. And it may still be required by local code, so be sure to check that. If you're sharing conduit with another circuit like I am, you can fortunately splice and use the same ground wire for both circuits if you so choose. Just make sure to look at table 250.122 to make sure that the amperage that you're designing your circuit to be has the appropriate size ground conductor. In my case, it's 10 gauge that I'll be running for both circuits. I used solid wire as it's a little bit cheaper than stranded, but it can be a little tougher to work with. So just make sure to take that into consideration when you're doing your design. Finally, the ground wire should be housed in a green housing or a bare copper wire. All right, so now that we've pulled our wires, the tips of these wires have lived a nice, difficult life getting pulled through conduit. So we're going to start by trimming that so we get a nice clean end on our wires. Now cut down and just kind of peel the insulation away. That ensures that we don't cut any of those fine strands in our six gauge. Now we take our breaker. This is just a 60 amp ABB breaker uh, that fits a GE box. It is type THQL. It is not GFCI. You actually don't need a GFCI breaker if you're hardwiring your electric vehicle charger. If you're wiring it to a plug, uh, NEMA 1450, for example, you would need a GFCI. So not using a GFCI saves us $50 to $100, and hardwiring also allows us to use more amps than a plug would. So it's a win-win from my perspective. We'll loosen these lugs and slide the wires into the bottom, and then tighten. Now, if you have a torque wrench, it does say to torque to 45 inch-pounds. I don't have one, unfortunately, but we'll just go ahead and get it good and tight. Don't want it too tight, obviously, but tight enough that the wires aren't going to find themselves getting ganked out of the breaker. That would be bad. We're going to put the breaker to the off position to start while we put it in. You're going to also want to de-energize your panel just so that in the off chance that you come in contact with any of the bus bars, you'll be safe. Now that I got the wires pulled through the LB, I'm going to seal it up with my PVC cement. Again, I'm sealing all of my PVC starting from the box and working my way out. That just helps make sure that all my lengths are correct and uh, if I need to make a trim or pull a piece apart as I just did in order to pull wires, um, I can do that. This is pretty much hit and print on your book report. There's no going back. Now, once again, we're going to want to trim these ideally so they're all the same length. It's going to be green ground in the middle and our lines on either side of it into these three terminals. It's all wired up. Let's go close that breaker and see what happens. And there we go, we have a blinking light. It is ready for setup. Let's open up our phone and complete the process. To finish setting up your HomeFlex, download the ChargePoint app, which you may already have if you charge your EV at public charging stations that are part of the ChargePoint network. 
After connecting to the charger's built-in Wi-Fi network, you'll choose the installation method that pertains to you, in our case it was hardwired, and then specify the capacity of the breaker that's protecting this circuit. In our case, we installed a 60 amp breaker, which will enable safe charging at 48 amps. You then specify your home Wi-Fi network so you can access this from your smartphone. Part of the reason I chose this unit over the Tesla wall connector is that it's currently the only available unit that will allow me to participate in Excel Energy's EV Accelerated Home program, which provides customers with cheap off-peak electricity rates without any additional metering or service equipment. And here's the moment of truth. Go ahead and push the button, see if that opens the back. Sure enough, it does. I heard a contactor. And there we are, 48 amps registered on the car. Just for fun, let's try this clip-on ammeter. There you go, 48.5 amps. The unit's LEDs will also blink blue when charging. So I pulled a permit with the city of St. Paul prior to installing this charger. And when the electrical inspector came out, he had only two things to say about it. First thing, he checked the nameplate and noticed that it's wired up for 48 amps on a 60 amp breaker, but the nameplate only had 40 amps written on the bottom. That's where I went back to my pamphlet that this came with and I saw that there are stickers that came with the unit that you should apply to the bottom which denote what capacity you've configured your charger for and what size breaker it's on. So I found 240 volt 48 amp sticker, applied it to the bottom of the unit and we're good there. The other thing that he mentioned was this small gap here in the concrete between the garage in the house. Rodents, mice, dust, bugs can get in there. So he recommended duct seal. And duct seal is a great way to just seal up those little cracks, provide a little bit of barrier against moisture intrusion and other pests. So once I took care of those two things, he had no problem signing off on the electrical permit. And off we go with our Max Charge Point Home Flex. Lastly, while many auto companies have signaled their intention to switch to NACs from the J1772 standard, many EVs on the road today still use the old plug. Fortunately, inexpensive adapters like this one allow you to use the NACs Home Flex with legacy J1772 vehicles, truly making this a universal charging station. Thanks for watching and happy electric driving.